Our scripture text this morning is found in Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, where the high priest confronted them. Didn't we tell you never again to teach in this man's name? He demanded, instead you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want us to be made you want to make us responsible for his death? But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. Forty-five years ago last week, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., was assassinated. A friend of mine scoured every paper, didn't find one mention of it that on the 45th anniversary. Later in Facebook or something, USA Today put a little, maybe it was tweeted, a little blurb recognizing that 45 years ago he had been assassinated. 
But 50 years ago, next week, he wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. It became an important document in the history of the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s and remains a discussion of the duty of every citizen to resist unjust laws for an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This will then lead us to the biblical text where we wind up, not in a Birmingham jail, but a Jerusalem jail. Peter has something to say, as did MLK Jr., about where and when it is okay to disobey man's laws. So what were you doing in April 1963? It's been a while, 50 years now. If you're a senior citizen, you might have watched the debut of the long-running soap opera, General Hospital. Katie Couric visited it last night on ABC. If you are a baby boomer, you might have purchased the first album put out by the Beatles. Please, please me. If you are the member of Gener X, Generations X, Y or Z, you weren't even born yet. But if you were a leader of the clergy in Alabama, you would have received a strongly worded letter from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On April 16, 1963, King issued his letter from Birmingham jail. The civil rights leader was locked up in the city jail after being arrested for his part in the Birmingham campaign, a nonviolent protest conducted by the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. King was president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and had been invited by the Alabama Christian Movement to take part in the protest. King wrote his letter on the margins of a newspaper, which was the only paper he could find. Bits and pieces of the letter were carried by his lawyers back to the headquarters of the movement. So why did King write the letter? How many of you know? We've heard of the letter. Any of you know why? I didn't either, so you're not in, uh, alone. Eight white Alabama clergymen, four bishops, three pastors, and one rabbi had written a statement calling King's efforts unwise and untimely. They agreed that racial segregation was a problem, but that it should be handled in the courts instead of in the streets. These religious leaders rebuked King for being an outsider. He was from Atlanta, Georgia. And as an outsider, he was causing undue problems in Birmingham. King responded by saying that he was not an outsider because he had ties to the Alabama Christian movement. But more importantly, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. All communities and states are interrelated, he asserted, and injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Therefore, anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider. Alabama clergy leaders were upset because demonstrations were happening in Birmingham. King acknowledged that the demonstrations were unfortunate, but said it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. The church leaders also questioned the timing of the protests. They wanted King to wait and see if a new city administration would improve conditions for blacks. But King responded that for blacks in the United States, the word wait almost always meant never. They had already been waiting 340 years for their constitutional and God-given rights. 
340 years. That was before the First Baptist Church in America was created. That's too long to wait. King was sick and tired of waiting for human authorities to act. It was time to obey God. Not that King was the first to practice civil disobedience. He spoke of the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you remember how they practiced civil disobedience? They would not bow down to the statue. They would not follow laws of Nebuchadnezzar. Socrates practiced civil disobedience in ancient Greece. American patriots practiced civil disobedience in the Boston Tea Party. And of course, early Christians faced persecution for their faith. Like Martin Luther King Jr., they knew that they must trust and obey God, not human authority. The story of Peter and the apostles could easily be labeled a letter from a Jerusalem jail. They had been arrested for performing numerous healings and for telling the story of Jesus. Their time in jail did not last long because an angel opened the prison doors and brought them out to continue their teaching. On the day of the apostles' trial, the temple priest arrested them again, and they were brought to stand before the Jewish council. The high priest questioned them, saying, we gave you strict orders not to teach in the name of Jesus. Yet, here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. In other words, the efforts of the apostles were unwise and untimely. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. The apostles decided to obey God rather than humans, a bold stand for them to take. But how did they know that they were hearing the voice of God? It's a question we ask. This was a problem for Martin Luther King Jr. as well. After all, the clergy of Birmingham believed that they were obeying God, just like the high priests and council of Jerusalem did. And they also had the authority of human beings on their side. King addresses this question head on in his letter from Birmingham jail. He says that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws, King says. One that not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. <clears throat> But how do we know the difference between the two? That's the tough part. A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God, explains King. <clears throat> An unjust law is a law that is out of harmony with the moral law. A just law, according to King, is any law that uplifts human personality. <coughs> Excuse me. An unjust law is any law that degrades human personality. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Based on this reasoning, he concludes that all segregation statues are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. King quotes a theologian, Paul Tillich, in saying that sin is separation, and then makes the point that segregation is an expression of the man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness. If segregation is sin, then King can justifiably urge his followers to disobey segregation ordinances, for they are morally wrong. Segregation ordinances can be disobeyed because they are unjust laws, codes that are out of harmony with the moral law. <clears throat> he considers unjust laws not to be laws at all. Let's apply this same reasoning to the acts of the apostles. If just laws uplift human personality, then we want to be on the side of any uplifting action. Peter and the apostles point out that the God of our ancestors raised up Jesus. That's uplifting. God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior. That's uplifting. That he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Uplifting. We are witnesses to these things and so is the Holy Spirit. That's uplifting for us. Peter and the apostles believe that all who obey God are obeying his just and uplifting laws. On the other hand, the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem killed Jesus by hanging him on a tree. That's an act that degrades human personality, making it an unjust law. Just laws uplift, unjust laws degrade. What was true in Jerusalem was also true in Birmingham in 1963 and true in the world in which we live. <coughs> Christians today are certainly going to have different ideas about where to draw the line between just and unjust laws. We're going to make different choices about when and where to practice civil disobedience. We may not all agree with each other, but we need to support each other in our attempts to follow the guidance of God. Some will march in pro-life rallies based on their belief that an unborn child has a right to life. Some will take stands for marriage equality based on their conviction that gays as well as straights have a right to marry. Some will join demonstrations for immigration reform because they are convinced that our current system is unfair and degrading. Some will join a movement to end child sex slavery and human trafficking based upon their convictions. Others will disagree with them. In each of these cases, the challenge is to obey God and fight for laws that uplift human beings. The apostles did this, civil rights leaders did this, and we are called to do it today. We don't always, won't always be popular for these stands, and we certainly won't enjoy quick and easy success. We may even encounter resistance persecution or arrest. Preaching in Jerusalem led to the jailing of Peter, the death of Stephen, and finally a persecution that scattered most of the Jerusalem church. Later in Acts, Paul and Barnabas tell the ordinary disciples, it is through many persecutions that we must enter the kingdom of God. Persecution may come. It took the lives of Paul, it took the life of Martin Luther King Jr. It may threaten us as well, but obeying God is worth the sacrifice, especially if our actions raise other people up and lift us a little closer to the kingdom of God. Let us pray. O 
O Lord, our God. We pray that you would work in our spirits to help us to know the difference between just and unjust. When we are convinced, help us to know what action we should take that we might uplift others, that we might help to bring others into your presence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.